the Washington National Intelligencer, which was the main newspaper of the city back in the early 19th century, had actually been um, indexed by a very, very diligent lady. And thank God, because I was able to find these kinds of things. This was an um, advertisement in the Intelligencer, 1842, for one Runaway Slave from Joshua Pierce. Um, this is a sale of the estate of Abner Cloud. That was actually from another newspaper, but it's a list of his property. And I tell you something, reading this, when he talks about his property, and when I got to this, a number of reliable Negroes that stopped me cold. I mean, I'm no stranger to all of this. I grew up around here. I certainly know my parents from the South. I know a lot about slavery, but, or superficially. But to see that on this man's um, bill of property was quite, I don't know, just um, moving, shocking, whatever you want to say it to me, and to think about that. And it got me to look a little bit further into the slaveholding legacy of these families. Because not only did um, Joshua Pierce and the Clouds have slaves, but Interestingly, one of the shoemakers, though, George Shoemaker, okay, we're talking about a whole new person here, actually stayed in the Quaker faith, and he became the president of the Farmers and Mechanics Bank in Georgetown and was the president there during the Civil War. So you had one very prominent member of the family who was not a slaveholder. And I always thought, boy, I wish I had some access to letters or diaries of these people. We just didn't find any of that, because you can imagine the debates that might have gone on within that family, might have gone on. Maybe they didn't have them. But you know, during the Civil War, this family, the Pierces and the Shoemakers, they had this, this land holding there. And unlike some um, residents of Washington, those who were from Virginia and other states, they didn't leave. Actually, one of their neighbors, who was the treasurer of the United States, William Selden, he left and went back to Virginia and had to sell his um, farm at a loss. But the Pierces kind of kept their head down. That's what I call it, because it's very, very difficult to find anything relating to that period for them. Kept their heads down. Their farm was spared when the Confederates invaded Washington and had the battle at Fort Stevens. They were also spared during the War of 1812 because they were far enough out that they didn't have um, any damage done to their farm. They were very lucky in this respect. Another aspect of their continuing good luck. OK, so during the Civil War, we don't hear much at all except that our friend Mr. Klingle, where is he? Yes. Joshua Pierce Klingle, who is actually a young man of draft age, he was in his 20s when the war started, he bought his way out of the draft, the United States draft, $300, which wasn't that unusual. And um, men of wealth had that. For what reasons he did that, we don't know again, because we never found any records. But he did that. And after the war, he got married. And he got married to a woman from a family, the Tiernan family, in Baltimore, who actually had relocated there from Port Tobacco, Virginia. And this family was suspected by the United States government of actually being Southern sympathizers in Baltimore and running guns to the Confederates. So I found it very interesting that he would marry a daughter of this particular family. I mean, I guess you know, you had all kinds of back and forth over the line, so to speak, Mason-Dixon line or the, the battle lines or whatever. But this is one of the things that just convinced me that the, um, the Pierce's may have been somewhat sympathetic to the Confederate cause. Pierce Shoemaker, the patriarch of the family, let's see if we can get to him down here further. Yes, this man, Pierce Shoemaker, he actually signed a petition <clears throat> to the Congress in the 1830s, late, early 40s. They were petitioning, these are landowners in DC who had slaves, petitioning the um, Congress not to take any action freeing the slaves in the District of Columbia. You know, that was, that was the first point of pressure during the abolitionist movement was that we, how can we have slavery in the District of Columbia? So he signed a letter against that, not surprisingly. Um, but then, not a peep. I mean, we, uh, the record just shows nothing. I'll get into a little bit more of that later. 
Okay, next to him on this slide is his bride, Martha Carberry Shoemaker. And Carberry may ring a bell with some of you. That is the family that was very prominent in the District of Columbia in the early 19th century. I think her father was the mayor of Washington. Uh, her uncle was the surveyor of the city. And on and on. Um, they were Irish Catholics, as were other families that Pierce has moved in, uh, married into. And Pierce Shoemaker became Catholic to marry her. Um, the Carberries actually had a very, very intriguing little family story, which I came upon, and, and mainly because somebody published a book about it about the time the mill reopened in 2011. Um, a woman named Mattingly, Mary Mattingly was one of her cousins, had become afflicted with a horrible cancer in 1820s. And she lived down uh, at the Carberry House at the corner of Constitution Avenue and 17th Street where the um, Red Cross DAR are now. And given that it was 1820, the prospects for her were not too good. And it looked like um, she would not be long for this world, but her family w uh, was in contact with um, some European noble persons, uh, one of whom was a German, um, ranking German uh, I, member of the clergy. I'm not sure exactly what his title was. I have it here in the book. In any event, he was known for his miraculous healings. And they got in touch with him. And they said they wanted him to intervene in this case. And he did. And just to make a long story short, he said prayers. I think it's known as a novena. Correct, forgive me if I'm wrong. But he said prayers at a certain time and date. Other people said prayers. And Mrs. Mattingly got up from her bed and walked away. Now, we've heard these stories a lot, I know. But interestingly enough, this is well documented in the newspapers of the time. And sh her family was visited by members of the Supreme Court. They all attested to this. I mean, this woman was afflicted with horrible, disfiguring scars from the cancer, according to all of the accounts. And somehow, it didn't kill her. So this intrigued a professor at Salem State University in Massachusetts named Nancy Schultz, who actually went to the records. She visited Georgetown Visitation to get the records there and put together an incredible book called Mrs. Mattingly's, Mattingly's Miracle, in which she doesn't, of course, settle the issue, but she does create the context. And it's a very, very well-written book on this little-known part of Washington history. And you know, the Catholic Church at that point was because of the fact that, uh, I guess, in, um, in, in terms of the time period, we're on the edge of, well, we, we were past the Enlightenment at that point. But their association with miracles was, um, while not, of course, I mean, they embraced them. But they didn't like to make, at least in this case, make a lot of, about it, because it exposed them to a lot of criticism and ridicule. So this did not become a. I guess, a, a really well-publicized event. But it was in the local papers. And so it remains a very interesting story to this day. <coughs> By the way, if you have questions, you know, you can, ask, you can raise your hand anytime. I don't care. It's, you know, we might as well do that. So OK. Now we come to the really fun part of this. Although, actually, I'd tell you one other thing I should tell you about the slaveholding legacy, which is interesting, back with um, Joshua Pierce Klingle. Joshua Pierce Klingle, as I said, didn't really want to continue in the horticulture business and run the nursery like his dad did. So he sold the um, nursery. But before doing that, his father died in 1867. And so he had the nursery for a few years. And he had to manage it. And his father wanted to, had said before he died, he wanted to hire the manager of the enslaved person who was the manager of that 
nursery back and pay him a pretty good salary. Um, and I believe it was something like $100 a month or some a week, I'm not sure, but it was for that position and that situation at that time, it was a good amount of money. Mr. Klingel did not like that. He thought it was way too much. And he wrote letters to that um, effect and made quite a big deal about it. But in the end, uh, since it was in his father's will, he had to follow it. But that was something I also discovered in the archives of the Na uh, National Archives, which was, which was very interesting, very revealing. And might tell you a little bit more about the, the times. You know, um, I think I've got the, um, let's get this right here. Excuse me. My mouth is not cooperating. Whoops. Back. Yes. This is the Washington Foundry, Foundlings Hospital, excuse me, which was created through the bequest of Joshua Pierce, the nurseryman, the man who owned Linnaean Hill. He put this in his will. He wanted to create this. He had no child, natural children, no biological children. Um, they had adopted Joshua Pierce. And perhaps he and his wife wanted to do something for children. Who knows? He didn't really elaborate on it. But interestingly, the rest of his family contested this. They didn't want to spend money on a foundlings hospital. Um, and I hate, I mean, I didn't see the, the way, I don't think the records were complete on this, so I didn't see the, the, the exact arguments. And I hate to think that it's because they just didn't think it was you know, worthwhile. But nevertheless, they lost, thank God. And they did build this wonderful building. It was segregated. It was whites only. It stayed there on um, around 14th and S Street for many decades. Then actually, finally, um, ended up near Tenley Town. And some of you may remember there was an orphan's or um, I don't know, the children's home there, which closed in the 50s or 60s or maybe even the early 70s. That was the descendant, so to speak. So getting back to this, um, you know, he, Joshua Pierce also left quite a um, generous bequest of money to his former slaves and almost pension-like in some of the details. And whether he was feeling guilty in retrospect, I'm not sure. But it, it was, I thought, um, different and interesting compared perhaps to some other situations. You know, because the Pierces and the Shoemakers, they all got compensation. When they had to free their slaves, when the district um, ordered emancipation a year before the national emancipation, part of the deal was they would provide compensation to the slaveholders here in DC. So the Pierces and the Shoemaker got uh, tens of thousands of dollars as compensation. And a lot of that, in the Joshua Pierce's case, went back to the former enslaved persons. So, you know, one could think about this some more, and maybe um, perhaps there were some second feeling, uh, second thoughts on his part. Not sure, but unfortunately, we just don't have a lot of records. Now, this is. This photograph right here is of the Association of the Oldest Inhabitants of the District of Columbia at 4th of July in 1911. And they are having a picnic at the home of Louis Shoemaker, the son of Pierce Shoemaker, who has become a big real estate, uh, well, for Washington standards, mogul. And that's him right there in the, in the uh, white, uh, in the formal outfit with his wife. And this is on the 4th of July in Washington, of course, so you can imagine how comfortable they were. Um, and this organization had started right after the Civil War uh, by folks who thought that the Yankees were going to just ruin this place and wanted to burst some of the old um, traditions and uh, spirit and that kind of thing. So the Association of the Old Inhabitants is still exists today. Um, they supported my book. They actually gave me a grant, which was very nice. But at this point, Louis Shoemaker, son of a slaveholder, actually had become kind of a patriotic Southern Democrat here in the district. And he was involved in um, you know, the Grand Army of the Republic uh, march here and other kinds of things. He uh, was involved in petitioning for home rule. And he was also responsible for the development of Brightwood and Tacoma Park to a large extent. He had another partner up in Tacoma Park. And he built a house up on Georgia Avenue near Walter Reed, which unfortunately got torn down right after he died in, in 1916. Okay. This is um, 
about the period when the mill had closed and was the park had been created. It was a popular place for picnics. Here we have a flapper-like lady um, and her friend picnicking by the dam. This dam, by the way, this dam on the right was a decorative dam they put in. That's the one that's still there today. It had nothing to do with milling. It was put in there in 19, around 1905 by the um, government in order to create a scenic waterfall because they had a tea house at the mill. They converted the tea house, uh, the mill into this little um, shop and porch area where you could sit on a Sunday afternoon, eat your sandwiches and have tea. And they thought, well, you've got to have some, you know, audio and uh, visual here. So let's have a waterfall. So they created the waterfall. Okay. This is one of the men who actually was in charge of um, the first restoration of the mill, which came in um, the mid-30s. It was a New Deal effort by Harold Ickes, who was the Secretary of the Interior, enlisted the Works Progress Administration, and they did it. They got the mill back in working condition for around $35,000. $35,000. <laughs> Just remember, how much did it cost us in 2011 to get it reopened? Three million dollars. <sighs> and thank God, the only reason we got that was because of the Obama stimulus plan. They actually, that actually funneled two million. We raised a million, but actually it was the two million from that that made the difference because the Park Service did not, will not, never would have that kind of money to spend on a mill. So we were very lucky in that respect, and we were also very lucky for substantial support from the Kiplinger family of Washington and a few other local foundations been very generous in both paying for uh, the restoration and also helping the Friends of Pierce Mill, which is the nonprofit that has been working with the Park Service as sort of co-managers since it reopened in 2011. But when this was reopened, it was, or rebuilt, or re, excuse me, it wasn't rebuilt because of the the stone building it still existed. Um, when this was restored, this was really the, one of the first, maybe the first preservation project of the federal government. This was 1930s when that had not become yet a, um, a real, um, it, it was just in its infancy, the whole idea of historic preservation. There had been, Mount Vernon had been preserved and some buildings in uh, Boston, that's something to do with Paul Revere and that kind of thing, and they had been preserved, but really, Preservation was still a very new field, and so this was a experiment in a way, and it was an experiment that worked very well. You know, they decided we are going to have um, flour for sale from this mill, so they hired a, a guy from uh, the hills of uh, West Virginia who knew about milling, and they brought him over here, and he started grinding and was selling it on a daily basis. And so that's what I'm sure a lot of you remember. I know my father went there with his cousins and got flour um, in the 1930s and 40s. And this continued on actually until 1993 when the mill broke down again. The shaft shattered one more time. And there are a lot of things that had to be done at that point. So it took about 20 years and $3 million to get it all back together again. And it's so structurally sound now that I think we could have probably, you know, a class five hurricane come through and that thing wouldn't go anywhere. I mean, we joke about how you can bring three football teams and put them on the second floor and have them jump up and down and it wouldn't break through. It has been reinforced with aged white oak. It's a foot and a half thick and add that to the stone that's already there. It's a very solid building at that point. Okay, so if, any questions about the history? Yes, ma'am. Why and when the change in the spelling of the name? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask me that question. <laughs> I should have a, a little. Need to repeat the question. Uh, yeah. Why and how was the name Pierce changed, the spelling change? As I mentioned, the first p spelling when they came over was P E A R C E from England. And then they became P. E I R C, and then some of them spelled it P I E C I E R C, and this just went back and forth for 200 years, and the last um, figure in the history of the mill spelled it P E I R C E. However, it 
<laughs> During the period, much of you probably know the mill. It was spelled P-I, okay, all right. So at that point um, in the 1990s, when we started doing our research for the restoration, um, it turned out that the majority of members of the family spelled it P-E-I-R-C-E, -E, and we informed the Park Service of that, and they said, okay, we're gonna change it back to that. So that's what it is today, by more or less by fiat, but you know, I hope it stays that way because it's been way too <laughs> confusing over the years. Yes, there was a question in the back. I have a question going back. You made a statement saying that the family wasn't affected by the Civil War. Yeah. Um, so the family owned, owned the land up until 1890. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so my question is, <laughs> I wanted to just clarify those. Things, yeah. But my question is, um, did they not own the land north of the military where the, um, where the battery and the fort is? They own bits and, yeah, parcels all over the Rock Creek Valley and nearby. And, but their house, I mean their home, was um, protected down in the, the valley where it is, there where the mill is, and there was no fighting or shelling going on. However, cousins of theirs, Carberries actually, had their house destroyed up near George Avenue. And um, who knows? I mean, and actually, the, the family did have some property at that corner there where Fort Reno, excuse me, Fort Stevens was. They had some property, but I think it was just a, a small um, building of some sort. I was thinking more of Jerusalem. Pardon me? I was thinking more Fort Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, again, I think that was mostly wooded and or just small holding farms and probably maybe people leasing it you know, a land from the, sh the shoemakers. Oh, okay. So they may have suffered, indeed. Any other questions? Yes? If there were eight mills along in the Rock Creek Valley, why did all the others falter and fail and get the stones taken right. away? Right. Well, as I said, I think that the um, combination of factors made the Pierces come out ahead. Um, they were good business people. They um, combined forces with other members of their family who were well-to-do, so they had a bit of a clan or conglomerate going on there. I mean, the shoemakers in Georgetown, they also had a mill, which was very uh, successful, big one on Water Street. Um, they had good millers who knew what they were doing. They had honest millers, and they were honest people because millers actually historically have been thought of as being not the kind of people you usually trust without really, really checking them out because you can adulterate flour very easily, and you won't know until the tasting, and you're not sure what it is. But it happened a lot. Millers were not the most reputable characters around over the centuries, but they probably had a reputation for honesty. And the mill was positioned on the creek in a way that they didn't suffer from low water in any way that hurt them. Because you know some places just don't have that kind of flow, they had a good flow. So all these things came together. Also the mill was never washed away because it was very solid and there were floods, but it didn't get, and it didn't burn either. There was never a fire. Some of them had fires. And then what was left, there were a couple of old structures that were left and um, they were basically torn down by the government when the park was created. They, said we got to get rid of all this old stuff, which is too bad because actually it would have been very scenic, but that was the, eth or the um, practice at that point. Yes? Uh, I'd like to know how you adulterate flour, but I would also be interested, <laughs> I'd also be interested in how was the grain transported to the mill and then how was it taken home? Was mm -hmm. there a barrel making operation mm -hmm. like this? Or yeah. what? How how did that operate under the conditions of horses and carriages? Well, the first question, you can adulterate it with sand, sawdust, dirt, you name it, anything. Well, and I don't think that's the only food stuff that's ever been adulterated or, you know, stuffed with stuff that's not particularly kosher, you know. Um, it's just an easy thing to do because if you're buying it in bulk, you know, and it's in a bag or a barrel, it would take quite a bit of time to go through every barrel and taste every last spoonful of that. And that's what I understand was the case. 
And okay, then then you wanted to ask about the um, method of transport. Well, because it was not a big mill and it was not on a river, you didn't get ships bringing in massive loads of wheat to be milled. But there was some from Georgetown which came up on um, horse-drawn carriages, and other farmers in the area would bring their grain in and, and the carriage. And then after it was ground, it was put in barrels or bags. And that, that little area around the mill was probably a, kind of a, a small village in a way because they, they had a sawmill there and they would have a blacksmith, you know, and a cooper and all of these people because there was, it was kind of like a crossroads. And it was a crossroads actually, officially too, but it was a place where because this business was going on pretty much night and day, um, you had to have all of these different services for the requirements of that time.